Joining us now is Ankush Kardori, former federal prosecutor and contributing writer for Politico magazine. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. So w w one of the things that I found most surprising in this very exhaustive, um, very well reported piece on uh, the attorney general is just how much of a political, I won't say actor um, or maybe savant, but how sensitive he is to the political trade winds. Can you talk a little bit more about that? because I think the public understands him, at least at this point, to be so decidedly apolitical. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that was really one of the things I wanted to get through in the piece. Because there is this notion that this is the judge, you know, he's devoid of politics, he's outside of the political realm, but he's had a career that has been intertwined with the fortunes of the Democratic Party. It's no accident that a lawyer just becomes the attorney general, not even the most brilliant, gracious, kind person. He has friends in politics, he's been in and out of political uh, um, legal circles for decades. And he has people who are deeply in, enmeshed in like the Clinton uh, world and the like. Um, so there's that, which is about his biography and his history. Mm -hmm. And I think secondarily, and this is sort of the, the, the latter half of the piece, is really well, what, how are politics or political considerations sort of hanging over his tenure at the Justice Department and how might they be influencing him for better or worse? Yeah. I mean, when you, given that, when we have all the news, the swirl around Biden and his possession, willful or not, of certain classified documents, lesser in number, the situation is again different, but nonetheless, finding classified documents at various residences or the office that he was using. I mean, for Garland, it is already such a complicated landscape. Do you feel like he is trying to really compensate for the fact that there is seemingly a looming criminal indictment over President Trump by being particularly aggressive on the Biden investigation? You know, I don't know if there truly is a looming criminal indictment. Obviously, um, we're in terrain where that's a very real possibility. Mm -hmm. Or at least the possibility of it, I guess. Correct. I mean, there's a special counsel was named last November, yeah. given a, 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 a mandate on two significant, two significant areas. Um, so I think that's one way of interpreting it. I, I think another way of just sort of thinking about it is, look, last August, he took an extraordinary step searching a former president's yeah. home uh, with the FBI. And then lo and behold, a few months later, he gets told by Joe Biden's lawyers, oh, we have some documents of our own. Yeah. I don't know this man particularly well. I did my best to channel him. If it were me, and I expect on some level him, he must have been irate. Because here he is going out on a limb, doing something right. truly unprecedented, generating all this political controversy and heat. And now it's just been sort of mucked around with as a result of Biden's conduct. Um, when we talk about the two special counsels he's appointed, I mean, Jack Smith is a special counsel who's overseeing the investigation into Mar-a-Lago and January 6th, President Trump's role in both. Uh, Robert Herr is the person that uh, Garland has chosen to look into the Biden documents situation. He is a decidedly more political actor. Do you think that that reflects... Uh, he's a partisan in, in a way that Jack Smith is not, it just in terms of do political donations and his role in the Trump administration. Do you think that that reflects anything in terms of Garland's, I won't say sense of uh, a punitive streak in Garland, but you, you think that he might have been actually frustrated by the disclosures from the Biden administration? I mean, I imagine he was. And, and to, the, to your point about, you know, this person having a, a, a more significant political profile than Jack Smith, I mean, he was a political pointee yeah. in the Trump administration. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's an accident. Um, I do think there's some effort to like, kind of make sure that if this investigation is going to happen, he can do his best at sort of placating people who may be skeptical of it, including by putting uh, a Trump appointee in charge of it. I mean, obviously, the person who had it before, John Lausch, was also a Trump appointee, yeah. the U.S. attorney in Chicago who's since left. Um, and honestly, I think that's one of those um, decisions that does reflect his sensitivity to public perception and the politics swirling around him, despite what many people have said. You make this really key point that early on in his career, he's very concerned about the institutional integrity of the Justice Department. There was the media circus around O.J. Simpson, and then he is tasked with managing the response to the Oklahoma City bombing. And this is kind of a story of how to, you know, not resurrect, but... but represent re to the American public the efficacy and the importance and the institutional integrity of the DOJ. It feels like we're in another moment in terms of Garland and the DOJ and what 
where we're going from here, right? We have this attack on the our sort of the institutions of democracy. There's a real, at least in some corners, skepticism about institutional integrity at the FBI and the DOJ. Here's a chance to restore that integrity. Do you think Garland is looking at it in such a high stakes manner? It doesn't feel like he wanted to have to take on Trump at the outset of his career as AG, and now he finds himself in almost an impossible position. The people who know him well will tell you that they, he understands all this, he gets the political stakes. I have a hard time squaring that with the actual record. Um, because as you say, you know, something hugely significant happened on January 6th. Joe Biden took office a couple weeks later, a couple months later is when Mayor Garland takes office. My own view as an observer is that at that point in time, there should have been a very aggressive and robust investigation into the Trump White House and the Trump campaign concerning January 6th and the months long campaign leading up to it and also the financial sort of shenanigans, but particularly January 6th. And your analogy is a good one, but you know, at a terrorist attack, there's gonna be no question that there's gonna be an aggressive law enforcement response. This was different. I think the, a, a comparable sort of level of responsiveness and aggressiveness should have been brought to bear, mm -hmm. not to be overzealous or, or irresponsible or anything like that, but that didn't happen. And I think 2021 and a significant part of 2022 appear, and we don't know exactly everything that went on in the Justice Department, appear to have gone by with them kind of hoping that they wouldn't have to deal with Trump head on. Yeah, well, thanks, January 6th committee. They really, those televised hearings changed the landscape as far as how we think of January 6th. Former federal prosecutor Ankush Kadori, thank you so much. Great reporting. Thank you. Today, the New Mexico legislature opened its new session with the new House Speaker, whose home was riddled with bullets last month. This may be the first time that election denialism has escalated to violence in the state of New Mexico. But like so many other places all over the United States, election denialism has caused plenty of other problems in the state over the last couple of years. Republican commissioners in one New Mexico county spent weeks refusing to certify the results of an election last year over fake election fraud claims. New Mexico's Secretary of State finally went to court and forced them to certify. The Secretary of State herself had to go into hiding for several weeks the previous year because of online threats. And as New Mexico's top elections official, she has a pivotal role as her state heads towards 2024. And that's all because election denialism and its violent repercussions do not seem to be going anywhere. Joining us now is New Mexico Secretary of State, Maggie Toulouse Oliver. Madam Secretary, thanks so much for being with us tonight. I just want to first get your reaction to um, the George Pena news, uh, Solomon Pena news, and just to understand what it's been like for Democratic lawmakers in the state of New Mexico and how you're feeling right now tonight. Well, thank you, Alex, for having me. I'm really grateful to be here to talk about this topic. And I will tell you tonight, I am feeling, and I know my colleagues, especially my colleagues who experienced actual bullets through their houses are feeling extremely relieved at the quick and decisive action of our local law enforcement officials, the Albuquerque Police Department, state police here in New Mexico. But for me, as somebody who has been on the front lines of dealing with threats and uh, now we're seeing actual acts of violence against elected officials here in the state, particularly as a result of election denialism and the lies and the mis and disinformation that have really pervaded a certain sect of our population over the last couple of years. I am deeply concerned because really we can see a through line now from the rhetoric uh, that was leading up to the 2020 election all the way through December, uh, late in the year of 2022. And we're not just talking about violence now, we're seeing it actually happen. You know, I think a lot of people think because there wasn't a January 6th style insurrection following the midterm elections, that somehow we've gotten to a better place. But I wonder what the view on that is from the state level. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the threat to democracy as it plays out in the state of New Mexico? 
Sure, well, I'll tell you my colleagues and I in the election world, and, and really this is not just Democrats. Uh, it, it is people of both parties, independents, who work in elections for a living. We were we were all saying, you know, wow, this, this election, it's been a lot calmer, uh, a lot less chaotic, a lot less stressful and, and threatening than the 2020 election was. But we all sort of uh, are waiting for the other shoe to drop, so to speak. We, we know that the person pervasive sentiments that have been uh, created by the rhetoric of the big lie have not gone away. And we know that there are still a lot of people out there uh, who genuinely believe that the election was stolen and who also believe that the only way to deal with political conflict is to address it through violence. And this, this just reiterates what I have said and what my colleagues have said over and over again since 2020. The rhetoric has got to stop because it's it's not just a political tactic anymore. It is creating actual violence in our communities. It is affecting human beings like me and my family, my colleagues, my friends and their families in their daily lives. It's threatening their safety. I mean, I guess, what do you do short of making the case that this isn't the answer? We're human beings. Don't put my 10-year-old daughter's life in danger because you think the election was rigged. I mean, we began this segment talking about the findings of the team purple on the January 6th committee, and they detail with great specificity the radicalizing force of social media. How do you combat that as a state-level elections official? I mean, what recourse do you have? What resources do you have? Well, first and foremost, we have to push back on the lies. And as you know, we have been doing that, and we have been doing it very strongly and forcefully over the last couple of years. But the next step is to take legislative action to ensure accountability and make sure that justice is being served for those who are not only uh, just contemplating, but obviously for those who are carrying out these actions in real life. The work of the January 6th committee, I think, was a great example of that. Uh, and, and the prosecutions and the successful convictions that we have seen in federal court, uh, particularly one individual in my state who was a public office holder who was then removed from office for having participated in the insurrection. It can't just happen at the national level, at the state level, when we see this type of violent behavior as we've seen here in my state. Again, I'm grateful to our local law enforcement, but the next step is to hold these individuals who are responsible, accountable, and to prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. And working with the legislature in my state and across the country, other states, we need to take proactive action legislatively to make very clear that it is a very serious crime to just even to threaten the lives and well-beings of elected officials across the country. I mean, the thing, the other thing I worry about is beyond the the very urgent safety issue. It's it has a it must have a chilling effect in terms of who volunteers to want to be part of this system, to be an elections official, to be a secretary of state. I mean, how do you grapple with this? Why do you still do a job that has forced you into hiding? I mean, obviously, it's very important for the functioning of democracy, but you're a person too, and I'm sure. You have to worry about the safety of your own safety and that of your loved ones. How do you make that choice? It's such a good question, Alex. And, you know, I ran for a second full term of office here in New Mexico last year, fully knowing, you know, the potential threats that I was going to subject myself to. And I had to think about it very hard. Uh, you know, I had to think about, you know, this isn't a job that I do for my own mental health and well-being, right? And I do acknowledge that there are potentially very serious threats to my life and to my family's life. But that's the reality of justice and, and the right to vote in democracy in this country. I am not part of a cohort that is facing this for the first time. So many people in our nation's history have had to face threats to their lives and quite frankly have lost their lives for the fight for democracy in this country. So I am not any different. I am just willing to do the work and I'm willing to fight and to speak out and to do everything I can do to protect myself in light of the threats. And that is exactly what we need, again, on both sides of the aisle and independence and everybody who we need to come together to run our nation's democracy, to make sure that it's healthy and that it thrives, is that willingness to say, yes, we acknowledge there is risk, but so many people have come before us to do the same. Well, I'm, we're all so deeply grateful 
for everything you're doing to keep the, the democracy of the United States on track, and I'm sorry that you have to make the decisions and the calculations that you do. New Mexico Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver, thanks so much for your time tonight. Thank you. I'm going to show you a local Illinois TV news segment that the HGTV star Matt Blashaw did back in October about winter coming. And I want you to try and guess which industry lobby he was quietly getting checks from. When I think of winter, I think of being inside. I think of getting uh, cooking with the family, like on the range behind me, being by a roaring fire. And with propane, that is all possible. And if you're running into maintenance issues on that furnace, consider using these great federal tax credits and upgrading to a propane powered furnace. What I don't like about wood burning fireplaces, I love the smell, I love the crackle, I don't love going out in the middle of winter to go get the wood and then having to clean out the firebox and the flue at the end of winter yes. as well. So for me, propane is the way to go with my fireplace. It is not subtle. HGTV's Matt Blashaw is getting paid to push propane and he is not alone. The New York Times reports that an organization called the Propane Education and Research Council, or PERC, has spent millions of dollars on provocative anti-electrification messaging for TV, print, and social media using influencers like Mr. Blashaw. That is despite the fact that the overwhelming majority of the scientific community agrees that the burning of fossil fuels is dangerously heating our planet, and the fact that propane and gas as appliances can emit dangerous levels of toxic chemicals. And the fact that electricity is just cheaper to begin with. But that's the point. They're spending money to get you to spend your money on a product that in many cases just doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. This year, in 2023, Perk plans to spend another $13 million on its anti-electrification campaign. So the next time you settle into the couch and flip on a home makeover show to unwind, be alert. The propane lobby may be the real star of that show, but it is not just propane, and it is not just TV. Ohio's Republican governor, Mike DeWine, signed a bill earlier this year so that individuals who want to build a chicken coop in their backyard can do so legally on a smaller scale, which sounds totally fine for the backyard chicken coop enthusiasts. But buried in that chicken bill was the very not chicken related amendment that legally redefined natural gas as a source of green energy. Natural gas, which is primarily methane, is not green energy. It is a fossil fuel. And according to the EPA, it is more than 25 times as potent as carbon dioxide at trapping heat in the atmosphere. This chicken bill also changed state regulations to make it easier to frack on state-owned land. It changed regulatory language from saying that state agencies may lease state land for the production of oil and natural gas to saying they shall lease that land. So now agencies have to lease land for fracking. But here's the thing. Like HGTV hosts praising propane, this chicken bill was not fully homegrown. Today, the Washington Post revealed that two dark money groups with ties to the gas industry, they got the bill passed. The Empowerment Alliance spent more than a million dollars supporting Ohio Republicans in the 2022 election. This bill passed with only Republican support. The American Legislative Exchange Council, known as ALEC, it circulated a model bill for lawmakers to copy and paste and distributed talking points for the bill's proponents. And it worked. The law of the land in the state of Ohio now defies science and logic and instead reflects the desires of the natural gas industry. And that whole scheme is coming to a state near you. In a newsletter the Empowerment Alliance sent out on Friday, they wrote states like Texas, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia are top energy producing states. They should follow suit. On TV and on social media, in state legislatures, fossil fuel lobbies are running an all out campaign to try to trick you into thinking they aren't bad for the environment. Don't fall for it.